lot of very popular verses in this chapter. I mean, we could start off. Verse number one, I'm the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. I mean, this is the chapter where we find out that it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. Right? But, for a second time, we're only going to read one verse this morning, but I've got to say this. The Song of Solomon, a lot of people like to take it very literally and build doctrines and philosophies off of this. This literally is a set of love letters between King Solomon and the Shunammite Meg. That's literally what it is. But we can draw comparisons from this to our relationship with Christ. Right? Well, I mean, is not Christ the lily of the valleys, the rose of Sharon? Right? Well, verse number 16. The Bible says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Now this week, thinking a bunch. Y'all got to bear with me. This might be a weird one today, Brother Rick. But <clears throat> this week, everything that we heard all throughout revival was essentially returning to the joy of our espousals right the appreciation the love that we had for the Lord when we first got saved right recommitting to him when it gets hard just press on through it right today's going to be hard tomorrow may be harder but God's still as good today as he was yesterday and will be tomorrow it's not contingent upon me it's contingent upon what he can do not what I can do the arm of flesh will fail you right lean not on your own understanding right trust the Lord with all our heart Right? It's not about what we can understand, what we can figure out, but rather, it's about how much we can give ourselves over to the Lord. Because that's when business really picks up. I mean, Jesus said that I, if I be lifted up, he'd draw all men unto him. We can't even lift up Christ the way that he deserves through praise and worship. I mean, really, the best praiser that you can be, Christ deserves more praise. Right, the best worshiper that you are, Christ deserves more worship. As much as we can try in our vocabulary to try and explain to somebody else how great Jesus is, he's greater. Our words fail us. Truly, all we can do is step out of the way and say, Lord, I'll do what you tell me to do, but I'm believing the Holy Ghost is going to do the rest. You know who can lift up God to where people can really see him? God. But you know what that requires? Us getting out the way. Us allowing and being obedient, subservient enough to say, Lord, I'll humble myself to where I get as low as I can get so that they can get a better picture of you. I mean, didn't the Apostle Paul say, when I am weak, then, I'm, then am I strong? For God's grace is made perfect in weakness. Well, I think about all that this week. Then, this verse came back to my mind. My beloved is mine, and I am his. I mean, that's the way that marriage works. Right? I, I haven't asked Christian. He was, him and Taya is dumb enough to get married. <laughs> right? They got a tax break, but they got a whole lot more headaches out of it. Right? Mostly Taya. But, and then they got a dog and so, that dog very anxious. He'd run all the time. But anyway. <laughs> Point is, the vows of matrimony, according to your Bible, right, what does God do when two get married? He takes two and makes them one. Amen. Both pledge to the other, what is mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. In other words, we in this together. We're no longer two individuals. We are one couple. Well, what is the Shunammite maid saying here? She says, my beloved is mine. There's no doubt in her mind that Solomon was hers. Didn't belong to anybody else. Right, but you could say, well, Solomon had many wives. Well, he never wrote love letters and pinned them down. Ended up becoming a book of the Bible for any of the other ones. But I truly believe there's something special about this one. 
But then she goes on to say, and I am his. But it, complete devotion from both. Neither one is living to fulfill their own desire. They are living to fulfill each other's desires, needs, wants. Well, this being a type of our relationship with God, if we were to go over to the New Testament, for sake of time, we're not going to read it. But you know what I find in the New Testament? The person of the Holy Ghost inhabits us. We are the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost after we get saved. The book says, I am in him, but he is also in me. It's more than just belonging to the We are a part of one another. You do realize that when you got saved, well, long before you ever got saved, he bore in his body the marks of your sin. He wrote your name in himself. Whether anybody receives it or not, he paid for everybody's sins. When those nails pierced his skin, when that crown of thorns strip the skin off of his forehead what he was doing was writing your name in himself then when he got saved what did he do he gave himself through the person of the Holy Ghost to you are we not in his hand his hands in the father's hands I mean didn't the songwriter I'm engraved in the palm of his hands you know what engraving means? It was done on purpose. You can scratch something, you didn't do that on purpose. But if you engrave something into something else, you did it deliberately. Here, this maid says, my beloved's mine and I'm his. Completely given to one another. That's the way that our spiritual relationship should be. But then I started thinking, I told you this is going to get weird. Y'all know what the definition of a cyborg is? A cyborg is a person that obtains superhuman abilities through technology. You know what a cell phone is? Really think about it. You know what a cell phone allows you to do? You can talk to somebody on the other side of the world. That's superhuman. You couldn't do that without technology. You know what your cell phone allows you? Your cell phone allows you to purchase something from somebody. Maybe Jeff Bezos, may not be Jeff Bezos. I don't know. Whoever is selling it on Amazon. You can buy something that you've never seen, you've never touched, that you have no idea where it's at. And yet, it'll show up at your door two days later if you got Amazon Prime. That's unnatural. The natural man says, I see it, then I buy it. Sometimes they don't even have pictures of the thing. You're just buying it off of faith. Right, good luck with that. Read the description. There are a whole bunch of people come find out. They buy, oh, I bought a chair for like $30. And it shows up and it's this big. <laughs> Got to read the descriptions. Now, you do realize that your long before it was a phone, right? There were camcorders, and then back before that, the big old crank cameras. Now, you know what those things allow you to do? They allow you to capture time. That's unnatural. Time is fleeting. In fact, today's here, today, gone tomorrow. Remember Bobby said, I believe on Friday night, our life is as a vapor. Right? But yet through tech, we can capture time and really play it. What do you say? There's so much of innovation that has become a part of you. If I took your phone away and gave you a random address, how long would it take you to get there? Right? That's become a part of you. How many of you still have a map that you'd be able to pull out? 
I guarantee you it wouldn't be up to date with all the road changes anyway. But truly, if you had to get a message to somebody and you didn't have your cell phone, how would you do it? Now granted, that's the whole business model. They make things so accessible and so easy that it just becomes a part of you. Right? We don't think twice about getting in a car and moving faster than any human can naturally move on their own and then getting upset when we have to slow down a little. Right? People fly on planes all the time not freaking out with their mind blown that they are literally flying through the air. Right? It's become second nature to people. But see, all those things, because you don't have enough faith, Brother Rick. <laughs> he said, not him on flying planes. I said, it's because he doesn't have enough faith. But the whole point is that these things have just slowly become a part. How much of your life and your relationship, how much of that has just become a part of your life? If we took all those other things away, how much more time would we devote to God? Not saying that there's anything wrong. I'm just saying because they're so accessible and so convenient, right, blessing and cursing and everything. I know this. Right, my phone's right over there in the pew. The only reason I don't have it up here is because I feel like I'm weighed down on one side if I keep it in my suitcoat pocket. Right, and I'll tell you, I got the unlimited data plan. Right? I'm sucking as much of the internet through that thing as it will allow me to. Right? But what's the point? If we were to take it away and you needed to know the definition of a word, do you have a dictionary? If we took everybody's iPads and iPhones away and we said, go find a verse in your Bible on X, would you be able to do it? Because see, I've got a big old concordance about that big on my desk. I can find you whatever you want. And not just one verse, I'll give you every verse that has that word in it in the Bible. Unless it's something like A or the or you know, one of them. But you know how often I use that? Not very often, because on my iPad I've got the same concordance, but if I touch the word, all the other times that it comes up, shows up. It's more convenient. Doing the same thing. What are you saying? Literally, your phones become a part of you. People have panic attacks if they leave the house without it. Right? Some people driving a car, if they need their cell phone, they'll reach in the back seat in the purse, or if it slipped, they'll dive up underneath it while it's moving. That's psychotic. But literally, do you know what happened? That thing's changed you. I'm not talking, I'm not talking spiritually, I'm talking physically. All the studies that have come out, technology, that little thing has changed the way that the chemistry in my brain works. Right? You want to know why so many kids are depressed nowadays? It's because those things are little dopamine hits that make them feel special about themselves, and then when they don't have that. They'll crave anything else to try and replace the feeling. That's not natural. It's not the way that God intended us to be as humans. I mean, so many other things literally change the way that your brain works. That's scary. Why? Because I know how convenient they are. It just takes a few tweaks. And next thing you know, you can get anybody to almost do anything that you want them to. As long as it's convenient. As long as it's already a part of them. But what are you saying? How much is God a part of you? You do realize if we went back over to Genesis. Right? God made Adam out of the dust of the ground. But until that point, he's just a pile of dust. But what's to say that God breathed into him the breath of life? God's breath was literally a part of Adam. It's what made him alive. That's what gave him a soul. 
Right? You are sold today still an after effect of the fact that God made man. That's why your soul knows that there's a God, whether you'll admit it or not. Whether the world admits it or not, they know that they're missing something because their very soul tells them this didn't come from a pile of goop you know, a couple of billion years ago. Right? This came from an almighty God. But yet, after we get saved, now we've got God dwelling inside of us. Do you really understand? I mean, we're talking about things, the phone can give you abilities that you didn't have before. Do you understand all the things that we can do now that should blow our mind? Do you understand that you, just you, it doesn't matter who it is, if you saved anybody, can pray to an all-holy, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God and according to your Bible, it's as if you're standing right there in front of them. That should blow our minds. That the very creator of the universe would allow me to talk directly to him. But see, do we understand that? I know we take it for granted. There's no doubt about that. You know how I know that we take it for granted? We don't talk to him as much as we should. But see, people are amazed that they can pick up a phone and talk to somebody on the other side of the world. I don't even know where heaven is. It's in the sides of the north. That's where his throne is. I know that. What's that mean? It's not here. I've never seen it. Don't know how to get there. Wouldn't be able to point you in the direction. I just know it's higher than anything else we got. Well, what do you say? I can talk to him there. Not knowing where it is. Never been there. Amen. I know my name's recorded there. Amen. One day I'll get there. Amen. But I know, not believe, no, because it's impossible for God to lie, that as long as I don't regard iniquity in my heart, my prayer goes directly to a thrice holy God. That should blow our minds. But yet, we're more interested in what's going to happen in the football game later today. And now we've gotten so lazy we don't even watch the game. We just check the score afterwards and pretend like we were a fan. Why? Because it's more convenient that way. I could take a nap and figure out what the score is now. Used to, if you didn't watch it live, you know when you found out? At the 7 o'clock news. You had to go the rest of the day without knowing. What do you say? We allow things like that to change us so much. Why don't we allow God to change us? In truth, He promised, well, the day He saved you, He made you into a new creature. But since He made the new creature, right? He can perfect the new creature, knowing just the taste that we've gotten. Why wouldn't I want more of what He's got? Why wouldn't I want God to do more in my life rather than less? I mean, he only gave me joy and peace. Literally only paid for my sin debt. Didn't even think that was... Didn't know it was possible, but then after I found out that I was a sinner, didn't think that he, you know, could, would. Not that he couldn't. But right, but I'm a sinner. Why would God any, want anything to do with me? But then all to find out, no, he's already paid for it. He just needs me to ask him so that he can. Best day of my life. Why wouldn't I want more of him? Not less. Now, you do realize that through the person of the Holy Ghost, with your relationship with him, the Bible says that he'd lead and guide you into all truth. You do understand that through this, you have access to knowledge that the world can never obtain. The world can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, but God can prepare you for it. The world can't promise you anything in the midst of all of your troubles, but God can give you peace. God can give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. God promised that if you cast all your cares on Him, that He would bear them for you. You know what that word cast means? 
means to deliberately throw away. If you cast an anchor, you don't just drop it on the boat. It's going to go through the hole of the boat. Then your boat's sinking. You have to cast an anchor. Right? Get it away from the boat so that it goes down into the water. If you cast a fishing line, you don't just drop it right there in the water. You don't need a fishing pole to do that. You can get a string and a hook and drop it right there in the water at your feet. But the reason it's so long is so that when you whip it, it sends that hook really far away. It's to get it to a place that you can't go. To cast all your cares, that means you're getting it away from you to a place that you can't go. You have no intent on ever seeing it again. You're casting it. So often we just drop our burdens at the Lord's feet. Well, if we don't care about them enough to just let them fall, why would He care about them? He said, cast all your cares upon Him, not all your burdens. He's not just going to pick up anything. No, you have to care enough about it to give it to God. It's got to mean something to you. You just didn't just drop it off on the ground. But you've got to cast it to Him, meaning, I care about it, and Lord, by faith... I believe if I throw it to him that he'll receive it. But I'm casting it away to where once I let go of it, I don't want it back. Lord, this means the world to me, but I believe you can do a better job with it than I can and get it away. What's the point of casting? If I cast it, I know it's gone. By faith, I believe that he received and he'll bear it for me. Why? Because he cares for you. That's what cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Will those things still wait a minute, will they still take up my thought process? Yeah. You know what happens? Keep casting. We have someone that said his yoke was easy and his burden was light. You know so many things that people get caught up in worrying about? keeps them awake at night, causes them to go on anxiety medication. I'm not talking about people that literally need it. I'm talking about people that are just freaked out and they don't know what else to do, so they'll try anything so that they can go to sleep at night. People that are so anxious that they go to the doctor, I don't know, it feels like I'm having a heart attack. Well, the doctor's going to say, well, obviously you're having panic attacks. They can treat those. But they're only treating the symptom, not the problem. The anxiety and the panic attacks, that's the result of something else. What is it? It's turmoil down here. Yes. It's warfare up here that we weren't equipped to fight. Not because he didn't give it to us, but because we didn't put it on. We'll let that dictate our day. If I took your phone away, how many of you couldn't order coffee in the morning? Yeah. don't even go through the drive through to order no 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 I'll send my order so that it's ready when I get there right? how many people wouldn't be able to pick up their groceries because they order them online now they just drive up to the door and somebody brings them out to them right? that's always been a thing by the way that wasn't just a COVID thing it's just it got popular during COVID I'm not allowed to leave the house I need somebody to bring my groceries to me. <laughs> and now that it's over, well, I don't like going to the grocery anymore. I can just keep coming and bringing it. What do you say? So much. Change. We don't even think about. I don't know about you, but a week ago, mine got an update. The only reason I knew that there was an update is because I, it came off the charger in the middle of the night and it said, well, it wasn't on the charger. We couldn't automatically update it. They don't even tell you when they're changing it anymore. It just happens while you're asleep. But don't blame them either because nobody else ever updated. How many of y'all still have a laptop somewhere in a storage room or somewhere from like the early 2000s that if you plugged it in today, it would say you have like 300 updates waiting to install because we never wanted to restart the computer. That's the only way they can update it is when you're asleep because if you're using it, you don't want to turn it off for three minutes. What do you say? We get so invested in things of the world 
Yet how much are we invested in the things of God? We're allowing that to change the way that your body works. The way that you think, the way that you crave, the, the way that when you have a question, you know what most people do? They pull out the phone. What if you ask God instead? Seriously. Some people, well, if I got that, that'd be X amount of money and well, if we refinance the house, we might be able to do it. Why don't you just ask God? Instead of pulling out your phone and doing all the math and seeing what kind of rate you can get on a refinance. What if you cared more about what God said than what Google said? What if you believed God as much as you believe Google? When was the last time you searched something on Google? Didn't even you didn't even go to option number two to figure out what, if somebody said something different. You just went to the first thing, read it, and believed it. What if we were that way with God? You see, here's the thing. We know a lot of this. We just don't believe it. You know it. You've taught it. You may have instructed somebody else that way, but you don't live it. Let's be honest. You have a relationship with the one that is all-powerful, all-knowing, all present someone that loves you more than what you know love is but yet you care more about somebody that just cuts your paycheck and sees you as an a thing a resource yet you care more about what the boss thinks than what God thinks just breaking it down been thinking about this stuff all week but I'm way down the rabbit hole by now. What do you say? Some of you care more about what your kids think of you than you do than what God thinks of you. Some people care more about what their spouse thinks or what their family thinks than they do what God thinks. I find that if we care more about father or mother or son or daughter, that we're robbing God of what's due Him. Preeminence. And I find that we, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Anything I put in front of him, I'm daring God to take away from me. But we don't see things like that. We see it as giving what we can to God. Well, didn't last week we talk about giving him what he truly deserves? I know I'll never be able to, this side of glory in this sin-cursed flesh, give him what he deserves but I do know that he deserves my best that he deserves to be first what do we hear about all week long God's going to take care of you all we've got to do is be committed to go out and do it but yet we play this you know this big old board game in our head well if I give this much time to God and this much time to this and that much time to this that's a happy life no the only happy life is one where you're in God's perfect will not always going to be present, but you'll have joy. I guarantee you that there's going to be more happy moments the more you get into this book. You may have to get some clay out of the way. Right? There may be some conviction. There may be some instruction, some correction. But the more you get in here, the more happy, happy, happy you're going to find. The more we get into that, all we find is that I'm pointing at my cell phone, by the way, not Brother Ray. The more we get into that, all we find is what we found didn't satisfy us. I've never found somebody, met somebody, heard about somebody that picked up a cell phone for whatever reason, and then after they got done, they said, wow, that's exactly what I needed. I don't need this anymore, and threw it away. Do you realize the most valuable currency right now in this market in the current world most valuable currency isn't a dollar bill it's not a stock somewhere it is your attention that's what the internet tries to steal from you they try to make their websites more convenient more pleasing and more 
addictive so that you give more of your attention to their company than you do to somebody else's company. You do realize that it's always been that way. It just hadn't been so convenient in a phone. That's what billboards were designed to do to capture some of your attention. Right? You realize that people, they don't want your time, they want your attention. I can be present and not hear a thing that you say. They want your focus, your attention. And everything in the world is designed to grab as much of your attention as it can. And every time that you look at it, they're taking every bit of that data and sending it to a supercomputer somewhere to process and churn out the data to say, well, how do we get that person to spend more attention on our thing? And all the, the whole world, right? They don't want your actions. The world doesn't care if you do good or you do evil. They just don't want you doing what God wants you to do. I mean, really, it gives different context over the Sermon on the Mount. Man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. Because whatever has your attention, that's all you care about in that moment. You want to know the people that get in wrecks? I, I'm speaking from experience on this one. You want to know people that get in wrecks? You know why they get in wrecks? Because their attention wasn't on what they were doing. Their attention was on where they were coming from, where they were going, what they've got to do once they get to where they're going, everything except what was going on right in front of them. You want to know why so many Christians' lives are a mess? Because instead of focusing on living for Christ, they're focused on everything else around them other than living. Amen. You do realize that planning doesn't accomplish anything. You've still got to do it. You can try and plan what God wants you to do. He just wants you to go out and do it. By faith, believing that He'll fulfill what you can't do. He'll take care of what your shortcomings are and replace them with His power. He just wants obedience. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. You can sacrifice the time and the effort of planning and trying to strategize everything. I'm not saying that we should just go off half cocked. Right? Decent and in order is what God said. But there comes a point where you can plan and plan and plan and plan, but until you do, it doesn't matter. There's more than one way to skin a cat. If God tells you to skin a cat, it doesn't matter how somebody else does it. You just do it the way you know how to do it. I talk to people a whole lot different than you talk to people. Why? Because we've got two different personalities. God doesn't want your attention. He wants your action. But if my attention's on something else, I'm doing this half-heartedly. God's not liable to reward that. To take it. And you, why? Because he demands our best, not our half. Everything else that we have going on in our life, when it steals our attention away, really what it's doing is it's stealing our heart away. You want to know where a man's heart is? Look at where he lays up his treasures. You know the most valuable treasure that you have is? Your attention. Where your attention is, that's where your heart is. You say, well, I'm trying to do something for the Lord. Hallelujah. But if you're not attentive to what you're doing... You're not doing it with all your heart. If something else means more to you that you think about it while you're trying to do something for God, that's where your heart is. That's truly what controls your life. Let me help you. Whatever you think about during church, during the singing, and during the preaching, and during the invitation, that's what really is the most important thing in your life. Because I mean... Let's just be honest. No halos in here. Right? If we can't come to the house of God, it's His. Dedicated to Him. Amen. Among His people that He bought with His own blood. To talk about Him, our Redeemer, our Savior, the King of Glory, and to unreservedly give back our best to Him on a day that we set aside for His honor and His glory even in this place 
where everything should be focused on him. All attention should be to him. There's a whole lot of time for our flesh to remind us of what we've got going on outside. You know what that tells me? My flesh is stronger than my spirit because I've been feeding it more. Because not only did he make us a priest where we could pray to him, we already talked about that, he made us kings. Us, Brother Ray. Just you and me. He'll build us from Kentucky. Right? He made you a king. Why? So that you can reign over your flesh. Keep it in submission. He didn't say that he would, you know, promise that one day you'd be a king. Well, you got to work at it really hard and then you can reign your flesh. No. Made us. That's past tense. Kings and priests. He's given you everything that you need to reign the flesh in. But if the flesh controls more of my intention, uh, attention, that tells me my heart's in the carnal man, not in the spiritual man. I've seen people, you can get them as far away from church as possible, like the Apostle John. He's over on the Isle of Patmos. It says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. You can get him as far away from church as you can. He's still going to worship God on Sunday. And did he do it out of ritual? Did he do it out of prayer? No. In spirit and in truth is what Jesus told the woman at the well. That the time now is that those that worship God will do it in spirit and in truth. Well, how are we supposed to worship him? He gave us his spirit so that we could worship him in spirit. We have the truth on how to worship him. John's out on the middle of an island somewhere exiled. They're hoping that he dies so that they don't have to deal with him anymore. And you know what he's doing? He's worshiping God and having himself time. His attention wasn't on where he was at, wasn't on how far away he was from God's house, wasn't on how the people that used to he'd worship with weren't there. No, his attention was just on Jesus. But yet so many of us can come in and our attention on everything else but Jesus. It's not about where you are. It's about what's the apple of your eye. What your heart truly desires. But there's good news. We haven't just been negative the whole time. The beauty of revival is to remind us how much God is worthy of our attention. We know all the things that we're supposed to do for the Lord reason people don't do it is because they don't want to give their attention to it they'd rather give their attention to something else for whatever reason there's a list mile long on the reason why people do things and most of the time they don't make sense that's why we're not supposed to lean on our own understanding that's what we heard about brother Greg preached about trust the Lord with what? Everything. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That's everything that you are. You know what that means? He's got my attention. There's so many people who will sacrifice part of their attention and say, well, I can get this. And I can use that. Well, once you have that, it's still not going to be enough. If it's replacing Jesus in your life, it's not going to satisfy. It's not going to give you any comfort. But yet, the good news is, now, the things that are a part of you, you don't make the conscious decision to give your attention to them. They've become a part of you. You don't even think about it anymore. But I guarantee you, I could, at lunch today, ask Christian, hey Christian, when's that store over there closed? Without thinking, he'd pull out his phone and look it up. And that's what I'd expect them to do. Because the only reason I'm asking him is because I don't have my phone to look it up for myself. Right? But those things that they're not even choices anymore, they're just reactions. Those things that are so much a part of you, you don't even think about it anymore. There's some people that because their phone's on vibrate all the time, there's a real condition where they feel their phone vibrating in their pocket when it's not there. It's their body telling them they've, they've lost something. They left something somewhere. They need to go back and get it. That's a part of somebody. Whether it's implanted in them or not. 
You can put it down, but if you put it down and all you're doing is thinking about how you left it, it's still a part of you. That's the same phenomenon that happens in your brain when people get addicted to drugs. Or people that are in toxic relationships that they know are bad for them. You know why they stay there? Because in their brain, that's the best that they can attain. What are you saying, brother? They become a part of you. I couldn't stop them from becoming a part of me, so how can I remove them once they're a part of me? I can't, but he can. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take some gumption to go before the Lord and humble yourself and say, Lord, show me them things that ought not be a part of me. And then make the deliberate decision to cast it on the, and say, Lord, I'm giving it to you. I don't know how to take it out of me and give it to you, but Lord, I'm casting it to you. And I believe that you can remove it. May take it it's going to be easy to relapse, to just go back to the way that you're used to doing it. But I promise you this, if you're serious about it, the Lord will take it. And you know what he replaces it with? More of himself. Go study your Bible. Whenever God asks for something, the reward is more of Him. He doesn't want it because He wants that thing. He wants your attention. So that He can be more present and prevalent in your life. Why do you think this war that we fight, 99.9% .9 of it is right here? Because you've only got so much time in a day but you've only got so much attention span. Time is useless without attention. You ever just sit there and doze off in a chair and then the next thing you know it's the end of the day? All that time didn't do you any good. What it takes is attention. You know when the devil ensnares you? When you're not paying attention. You know when God can do something? When people are attentive to the voice of the Lord. All this week, we've heard about how God's able, God will. All we've got to do is allow Him to do it and continue to persevere through hardness. Why? Because there's a reward that's worth it. But how good of a job of persevering are you going to do if your mind's on everything else except what you're doing? How many mistakes do we make daily that could be easily avoided if we just paid attention to what we were doing for the Lord? Here in the Song of Solomon, she said, I am my, my beloved's mind and I am his. Can we honestly say today that I am his and he is mine? That I am in him and he is in me just as much? Because that's the way God intended it to be. And anything less than that, we're living far below our privileges. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.